This film is a wildlife education project funded from state tax refund contributions. From seashore to mountain ridge, Virginia is a land of birds. More than 330 species have been recorded across the state, brightening the varied landscape with pleasing song and flying colors. Prominent on the lengthy checklist is the cardinal, Virginia's state bird. The strikingly red species is a favorite of nearly everybody, as it nests in our yards dines at our bird feeders, and picks fruit from our shrubbery. In its range, covering half the United States, the cardinal is so popular, six other states have chosen it their official bird. The cardinal is a homebody that may spend its entire life within a square mile. Because it does not migrate, the cardinal is here to add a touch of brilliance to a gray winter day. This, perhaps, is one of the keys to its popularity. Each year, Virginia's annual round of bird nesting begins in her winter forests with the courting song of the great horned owl. Both sexes give deep cello tone calls. The powerful owls may lay their eggs as early as January, and the female must keep them warm through late winter snowstorms. While she sits on the nest, her mate does most of the hunting for both of them, frequently beginning chores before dark. Great horned owls make no nests, but rely instead on tree snags, old hawk nests, and squirrel leaf nests for their nursery platforms. Fresh caught robin is first on this evening's menu. Later in the night, the young owls might dine on mouse, rabbit, duck, or even fish. The great horned owl is an opportunist among predators. Soon, these month-old young will leave the nest and become apprentice hunters, probably first practicing on insects. By now, April brings its new greens to the Virginia countryside, and many migrant birds are heading north. Now, too, liquid notes of the cardinal courtship songs are heard in the outdoors. The delicate task of nest building falls largely to the female. She selects a hidden home site in dense protective shelter, such as often offered by suburban landscape shrubbery. A typical cardinal clutch has three eggs. The hatchlings, naked and helpless at first, grow quickly. Nourished on a rich diet of insects, the young may fledge in just 10 days. Then, after a few more weeks of parental assistance, the young cardinals will be on their own. This rapid development allows the female time to start another brood, Often, she will have three families in one summer. Although most songbirds have more than one family per nesting season, overproduction is seldom a problem. Survival rates are low, and only one in three or four hatchlings may survive until its first birthday. Generally, that is enough to maintain a stable population. Once past that first critical year, the young cardinal stands a better chance of a long life. Exceptional cardinals may add their beauty and song to the world for more than a decade.
every species of bird is adapted to a particular type of habitat. While the sandy offshore islands of the Atlantic and Chesapeake offer little for thicket-loving cardinals, they are fine for the royal terns that gather several hundred strong in their communal nesting areas. Mob defense and island isolation gives them safety in an otherwise vulnerable site. During the few days that the downy young terns stay in the nest, they dine on fish delivered fresh from the ocean. Upon leaving the nest, all the youngsters of the colony assemble in a group. The roving mob, called the crush, seems to be a mass of confusion. But incredibly, each parent picks its own young from this crowded royal turn kindergarten. In the world of birds, design sometimes seems bizarre. Consider the beak of the black skimmer, which also nests and rests on the turn's sandy beaches. But form follows function, because that strange, oversized red and black lower mandible is the skimmer's tool of his trade. On long wings with great lifting power, the birds cruise over quiet waters, using the extended tip of the lower bill to scoop up shallow swimming crustaceans and minnows. The minnow is consumed without the loss of a wing beat. Another beachcomber equipped with a big beak is the American oyster catcher. His is a handy oyster shucker. Oyster catchers also eat various crustaceans and insects. These birds practice a peculiar territorial ritual called piping. When an intruder invades the nesting territory of a mated pair, the residents run in tandem and eventually discourage the intruder from hanging around. Not all Virginia's shoreline is bare sand. Some areas are tidal flats, covered with stands of sedges and grasses. These tidal flats are good feeding grounds for many birds including the yellow-crowned night heron. Here at low tide, the heron quietly stalks the elusive fiddler crab that ventures from its burrow, brandishing a threatening claw. The heron has a quick grab and a sensible respect for the crab's powerful pinchers. Once captured, the delicacy is carefully rearranged for transfer to the heron's gullet. Man's impact on the habitat of Virginia's coastal birds has been heavy. On the plus side, channel markers make ideal nest sites for ospreys. On the negative side, Ospreys and others are still recovering from the pesticides we allowed to accumulate in their aquatic food supplies. The poisons severely affected reproduction. Happily, osprey young are once again common channel marker fixtures. The bald eagle also suffered nesting failures from DDT poisoning, but it too appears to be recovering. The plummeting populations of eagles and ospreys served as important early warning that we were polluting the environment, not just of wildlife, but also of people. The bald eagle may never return to its former abundance because of human population pressures. But given our best conservation efforts, the giant flying national emblem should grace Virginia's skies on into the future. Our world would be poorer with the loss of the bald eagle or any species, big or small.
including even the retiring little seaside sparrow. Of all Virginia's wildlife habitats, perhaps the most productive are swamps and marshes. These wetlands are in short supply because we have so many uses for them. Long-legged great egrets and great blue herons visit marshes for fishing. The best holes often draw crowds of anglers. Each egret and heron is equipped with a long, sharp bill that serves as both spear and tong. Great egrets and blue herons alike nest in treetop colonies, sometimes by the hundreds, returning to the same heronry year after year. Herons seem awkward on their flimsy stick platforms, and young may fall and perish in the limbs below. Beneath the heronry, the flashing yellow prothonotary warblers brighten the swamps as they raise families in hollow trees. Back from the coast, all the way to the mountaintops, the land rises, and forests dominate the Virginia countryside. A prominent symbol of the big woodlands is the mighty pileated woodpecker. Mealtime for the growing lumberjacks in the nesting cavity is a loud and rowdy affair. The adult regurgitates food, mostly insects and a few berries, and with a jackhammer motion, rams it deep into the nestling's gullet. They clamor for more. Because the woodpecker uses its head so roughly, it has a special cranial cushion that protects its brain from shock. At night, the screech owl hunts these forests for green caterpillars. The young screech owls live in a deserted woodpecker hole. Like other members of the owl clan, the screech owl doesn't build a nest. It just finds one. On their diet of insects and small birds and mammals, the nestlings soon fill their cramped quarters. Then they fledge. Screech owls come in two color phases, red and gray. The colors have no relationship to sex. In southern states, the red phase seems more common, perhaps because it's camouflaged better for southern woods. But camouflage can't always save lives. Adult screech owls suffer an estimated 35% annual mortality. For screech owls and many wildlife species, high mortality is a fact of life. They face a constant barrage of deadly hazards from predators of all sorts, accidents and disease. They also are at the mercy of weather and other environmental factors with which they often have a delicate balance. Excessive rains and untimely snowstorms, for example, destroy nests. Birds are even hunted by other birds. The sleek Cooper's hawk is renowned for living on smaller birds. One study found that a pair of adult Cooper's hawks raising four young delivered to the nest more than 250 items of prey. 200 of them, birds. More than half a dozen species of hawks nest in Virginia. One of the most common is the red-tailed hawk. This husky raptor specializes in capturing small mammals. In the past, Shortages of rabbits, quail, and other small game species were often blamed on the red-tailed hawk and fellow members of the raptor clan. Research, however, has proved that game shortages are usually caused instead by poor habitat or sometimes disease, but not predators. 
Now, thanks to educational efforts by the Game Commission and others, hawks are protected by law. These laws reflect an understanding that predation is neither good nor bad in the wildlife community, but simply one way of life among many. Redtails frequently hunt from field side perches. The meadow mouse is a favorite food. Three or four make an average day's ration. The hawk's visual acuity is believed at least four times ours. And a mouse 100 yards away may be seen by the hungry bird. Small, easily handled rodents are preferred. But the red tail can also capture mammals as large as adult cottontails. Hooded warblers, predators surely as the red-tailed, are very deadly on caterpillars. Two dozen kinds of warblers nest in Virginia. All eat insects. Another woodland insect eater is the whippoorwill. It hunts at night and nests on the forest floor where it's blended out of sight. The northern oriole is at home in the treetops. Leaves often hide it from view. Cedar waxwings, which nest in the western half of Virginia, feed their young on wild fruits and berries. The food is transported to the nest in the adult's crop. Thus, the adult in front seems to have brought nothing to the young. But suddenly, it produces a wild cherry surprise. Virginia's woodlands host a great deal of bird life because they offer habitat variety. From tree to tree and from ground level to the highest leaf, every portion of the forest has its own occupants. Some species, including titmice, chickadees, and blue jays, are adaptable enough to live in various places. Others are more specialized. The red crossbill needs coniferous forests where its unusual beak helps extract seeds from cones. The towhee is fitted to ground living in forest thickets where it scratches for food. Its short wings are suitable for negotiating dense cover. Another highly specialized bird is the diminutive ruby-throated hummingbird. When fully grown, each of these young hummingbirds will equal the weight of a penny. The hummingbird's lengthy bill makes mealtime look like an acupuncture treatment. By the end of summer, these young will be ready to join adults in a remarkable migratory flight that will take them non-stop across the Gulf of Mexico. Special feeders with red sugar water lure hummingbirds into yards. Red flowers also attract them. Ruby-throated hummingbirds live on nectar and small insects, such as flies, ants, bees, and beetles. Only the male has the gorget, or colorful iridescent throat patch. As he hovers, his wings beat nearly 60 times a second. Among the best known birds are robins. They are familiar because our lawns are their hunting grounds for worms. As a result of changes we have made to the landscape, these popular birds are more numerous today than in pioneer times.
The goldfinches we see sharing the robin's bath water are at home where the land has been transformed into pastures, fields, and thickets. These areas have their own particular bird communities. In late summer, goldfinches feed on the seeds of wild sunflowers, whose yellow petals recently brightened the meadow. Goldfinches are primarily seed eaters. Goldfinches nest late in summer, July, August, and even September, when most weed seeds are ripening. The large family is raised by both adults, who deliver a partially digested wholesome whole grain cereal. The bluebird is well named for its sky-colored hue, but like the sky itself, it is not really blue. There is no blue pigment in the feathers. Instead, the feathers have a special layer of cells that reflect blue light. Out of direct sun in the nest cavity, for example, the feathers appear brownish gray. Bluebirds thrive best in open fields with scattered trees and thickets. The meadowlark is a grassland occupant, specializing in entomology and singing. By contrast, the seldom heard Henslow sparrow is a poor vocalist. Even if most of the vegetation is gone, the field may still have its breeding birds. Killdeer often nest in barren gravel. The shallow depression contains four eggs, marked to match the surrounding pebbles. Shorebird eggs are proportionately large, and the young killdeer will be well developed at hatching time. The long incubation period lasts about three and a half weeks. Within a day after hatching, the killdeer infants leave the home site for good. The lanky, fluffy, thumb-sized baby killdeer will be able to fly within six weeks. Since man and birds share this planet, we often rub elbows with wings and vice versa. Barn swallows, for example, are a common part of the farm scene. They are always welcome because of their pleasant disposition and appetite for insects. For the same reasons, people build condominiums for purple martins. One word describes the purple martin's diet, insects. Bluebirds, too, respond to our offers of home hospitality. We can have more birds around us by offering board as well as room. Some of the best foods grow on shrubs, bushes, and trees that might also serve as landscape decoration. A wild harvest of nuts, fruits, and berries can provide year-round rations for wildlife. With careful planning, we can replace much of the wildlife habitat destroyed in years past. Winter feeding stations bring birds directly into view. A variety of feeders with different foods attract more species of birds. Sunflower, millet, cracked corn, peanut products, thistle seed and suet all rank high in popularity. A good feeding station can draw up to 20 different species every day, including several migrants from the far north. Information on attracting birds with feeders or plants is usually readily available from local nature centers, parks, nurseries, bird food distributors, and representatives of the Game Commission. With feeding stations, birds get a free lunch, and we get the excitement of watching them. Their colorful activities awaken us to the lure of the outdoors, and this, more than any other reward, may be the gift of birds. The Virginia Game Commission invites you to learn more about the rich communities of birds and other wildlife gracing Virginia's yards, forests, fields, and waterways. 
A lifetime of enjoyment and discovery awaits you.